Jacinta, welcome to the Coach's Journey podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me on here. Yeah, it's, it's lovely to have you. I, I'm, like, I was just saying before we switched on, actually, like, I've just finished reading your book, and so I've got lots of questions about that, but I'm also curious to speak to you about Better Up, which is where we first met, um, and, and to hear more about your journey, and, and we'll get to that in a sec. But I, when I was reflecting just this morning or last night on well, how might the conversation start, this thing came to mind, which I want to say thank you for, um, which is that, you know, you may or may not remember this, but about three years ago, I wrote a, an article inspired by a part of the Meaning Revolution by Fred Kaufman. Mm -hmm. And you read it and liked it, which was really nice. And then you did something which was way above and beyond, which is that you sent it to Fred. <laughs> um, and he then uh, liked it and commented on it and, um, and shared it, which was really lovely. It was a, um, you know, one of my favorite, um, I'll link to it in the show notes, people who are interested if they're listening, but one of my favorite articles that's come out of my writing practice over the last five years, but also I've been reflecting recently on how I'm not very good at uh, remembering the uh, good feedback I get. Mm. So I'm good at remembering the bad feedback I get. And I'm sure some listeners and you know, you may even resonate with this. The good stuff tends to wash off me. And so I'm in yeah. a practice at the moment of collecting that more and trying to collect it and trying to internalize it more. And it, the reason that this is in my mind is because that article, partly because you sent it to Fred and it got shared, still occasionally people these days will discover it and like it or, or comment on it. And mm -hmm. when someone did that the other day and I went to reply to them, I, I saw that just above it was Fred's comment on the um, on the article, which I, to be honest, completely forgotten that he'd, he'd written. And so I was able to copy and paste that over into my, don't forget the nice things people say about your work, Robbie, document. So I just wanted to say, yeah, big thank you for that little moment of generosity. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Um, I am such a believer and it's a practice for me of savoring, yeah. um, really holding on and savoring uh, moments that stand out because there's so there's so many of them and they and they can slip by so quickly. Um, and then especially with other coaches, I feel like, um, you know, part of my delight was being able to share with Fred, who's an co amazing coach, who's a close friend and and show that he's infecting other coaches. And so it just turns into this kind of outward spiral of um, goodwill and appreciation for one another. And so the more I can look for opportunities to savor, but also then pass it forward, that's, that's, um, that's what I strive for. Oh, so so I'm glad nice. that, that uh, you remembered that moment. Yeah, that absolutely. Really yeah, absolutely. And, and it's interesting as well, because um, the piece is, was about, um, I think the chapter in The Meaning Revolution might be Die Before You Die. And I noticed when I was reading The Burnout Fix, your book, that you mentioned that you um, take clients often through an obituary writing practice as part yes. of that same piece. So great to hear that. I think that for me, you know, writing that piece was interesting because one of the practices that I think Fred says he has in that chapter is go into each coaching session as though it was the last time you're ever going to speak to this person, you know, which mm -hmm. is an amazing... Uh, amazing practice in not holding back and in fact I had a little bit of that today you might like this as well I was on a better up call but it was a what where I was coaching but it was a one-off coaching session because of one of the things they've got going at the moment so actually I had that yeah. again I was like okay I've only got this woman maybe for this 30 minutes now so therefore yeah. what does that mean well it means let's give her everything I've got yeah that's something I love about Fred's work and the lens he brings to coaching is that you know, zooming out, getting to that macro level so you can see everything in that bigger perspective. Because it's so easy to, you know, like coaches come in with, about, you know, their goals, but then they have their day-to-day -day things that happen between the sessions. And it's so easy to anchor in on those and, and forget the bigger macro process of what's happening. And um, so I really appreciate that about Fred of giving us that zoom out lens, um, which can be easily forgotten, especially when you have multiple clients in a day and you're kind of running through and you're meeting them where they're at. But what is the bigger context? And what if this is the last time you're going to see them again? How would you want to interact? Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, Jacinta, there's so many ways we could go from here, but I guess I'm curious as a starting point, when did you first come across this thing, coaching, that we're <laughs> probably going to talk quite a bit about in this conversation? When did you first hear the word in that respect or come across someone who did it? Yeah, so, uh, well, I used to be a dancer, so I was coached. Um, from early on, um, pulled out of my physical education classes to not work certain muscles in high school. And so was coached pretty intensely, but I always thought of coaching as like 
sport, you know, didn't really think of it as this other internal landscape exploration where we can better ourselves. Um, and so I ended up becoming a psychologist and I love clinical psychology, but I felt, um, you know, there was a piece of me that really wanted to help people get not just back to baseline, but above baseline and flourishing and thriving. And I had um, really specialized in this type of solution focused therapy, um, what is, which is much more directive. And I really liked that. I wanted to give my people tools and uh, techniques and homework. And so um, naturally found myself very curious about coaching. Wait, there's goals. Wait, this is very cool. You know, uh, we're going to like have an agenda really set for each session. There's so many um, pieces that I really liked about it. So uh, I had a psychology practice, which was based on positive psychology, and then moved it eventually to coaching um, and found that that was just such a nice fit for me where I was able to use what I know about the science of psychology and leadership, but then move that towards um, providing that in a coaching capacity. And it just aligned so much more um, for me. And I have never looked back since, like just <laughs> love coaching and then coaches too. I feel like these are, you know, I say this a lot. I'm like, coaching, coaches are like my people. Um, just really curious, wanting to help, um, wanting to make a difference, but, and wanting to constantly learn um, about themselves and others and doing so in, in a very specific way with deep questions, reflections, statements. And so I felt like I found my sweet spot. It took a little time. It wasn't a straightforward journey, but um, I've landed in a place that I'm very, very happy. And uh, I just feel lucky that I get to keep working like day in and day out in coaching, thinking about coaching all the time every day <laughs> <laughs> yeah well as you can tell why you know the reason that I've got this podcast um and and the, the surrounding things for coaches is because yeah I very feel very similar you know both absolutely love being in conversations with coaches and also I think there's something quite important about mm -hmm. th this this industry and this practice and you know perhaps perhaps particularly now in the midst of global pandemic and all that kind of thing but but I think even even without that and I like I learned about your your dancing from reading your book. I don't think I'd known about that before. And I just wondered before we kind of gloss over that too much. You know, it sounded I have a bit of a background in performing arts as well. And uh, it's interesting that the uh, you know I've I've come across that kind of that interest in in different forms of the arts in different ways mm -hmm. as I've interviewed coaches, but also as I've spoken to them. And it, it's not that everyone has it, but it's interesting to me that, mm -hmm. that, that you do. And I wonder, I'm curious if you've got any thoughts about uh, that, I guess, you know, coaches and those different arts performing and, and visual and otherwise. And also I'd just that, that thing about, or I'm also curious to hear about how that came to an end, because it sounds in the book like dancing was a really big part of your life for a while. Yeah, yeah, I'm so happy you asked this question because also a big reason I moved from like, you know, clinical, clinical psychology to coaching was I wanted more creativity in my work. And I do think coaching is highly creative. You are, I liken it to, you know, when you have those really great sessions, when you're in flow with a client, it is like playing jazz. Like you are riffing and you need a really good skill set. So in order to play jazz, you have to know scales. You have to be very good. And a good coach has to know, like have a really solid foundation to be able to flow and jive with a client. And so I find it incredibly creative, actually, of a process. Um, and then also thinking about coaching clients and, and, you know, what I'm going to, what we're going to work on and how we're going to embrace the session. All of it is highly interpersonal, but highly creative. It, it is like, um, you know, in dance, you partner and you do um, kind of work where you're just kind of improving together. And I just really like it to that a lot is just connecting with someone in this really improv way, but there's a baseline of really core skills and expertise that underline it. You can't just do that <laughs> easily. And that's why I think the craft of coaching is so fascinating. Um, so that was a big piece. And then the other piece is my story. Yeah. Um, I never thought I was going to be a coach or a psychologist or anything like what I'm doing now. If you had told me like a 
like, yeah, I would have been laughed at you. I would have never thought that I thought I was going to be a dancer. That was my thing. I loved it. I was inspired by it. I still am inspired by the arts. I feel like it, it really captures something that cognitively we sometimes don't feel. We can, there's, there's, there's change through art, um, like, and messages. And, and it's just really powerful form that's been in human history since, since our beginning of time. So I find it very important, but um, I, I was overly passionate. So I, I think passion and flow uh, can have a dark side where you can almost become like overly consumed with it. And I think that's what happened to me in dance is I just wouldn't stop. I thought that my commitment to dance, no matter what, meaning more specifically, I danced through broken jaw. I had concussions. I got second degree burns on my feet from performing outside at one point, like just injury after injury. Um, and I kept dancing through and eventually just completely burned myself out. Um, because I, I mistook, you know, I always say I mistook motion for meaning and that I thought, you know, moving forward meant that it was meaningful to me and that resting and stopping, it doesn't, then that would mean that it wasn't meaningful to you. Um, and I think I got that really backwards <laughs> in hindsight. <laughs> it's taken me a while, but I've come around to realize um, that resilience is about how you recharge, not how you endure. But it was a really humbling and disorienting experience for me. I was pretty young because dancers are just young in general. I think I was only like 18, 19. So it was a short career, but, but with dance, it's, uh, yeah. Um, and I had to pause and stop and go, how could I feel so disconnected from something that I loved so deeply? That was just mind blowing for me. Um, and so I'm, I, I, that's when I decided I need to study psychology. I need to study peak performance and motivation and behavior change. Um, and my first class was psychology of sport and performing art. And, um, yeah, I still that it's a tough, it's a tough, uh, thing for me still, I could get emotional when I think about it because I loved it so much. And I think part of it is I just don't want anyone, I know how much people put in their careers, how much impact people wanna make on the world. And I just don't want anyone else to have to defer their dreams or have to give up on something, especially coaches where we can hit compassion fatigue um, I just don't want to see that because it's usually the people who are the most engaged and invested and who are able to make the biggest impact um, to, that could have the tendency to be in a place where they get experience burnout. So that's kind of my full circle, kind of, I think of it as my hero's journey in some ways, like coming full around from, you know, young age of innocence, <laughs> you know, barely 18 to, to where I am now in my career. So thank you for asking about that. Mm. Yeah, and it, I mean, it was interesting. So I, I wasn't a dancer, um, although I, when I, I later worked at the Royal Opera House for a year, actually. Um, oh, and wow. so I always used to, when I was in, the, when I was in the, the, the lift with a male ballet dancer, I used to look at them and then look at myself and think, right, if you are the same shape I would be if I was in really good shape. So it's like, <laughs> I'm, I was never going to be a basketball player. I, I do sometimes wonder what would have happened if I'd gone to dance like my sister did from when she was about two years old. Um, oh, wow. So, and, and, and I think I, you know, I can really feel that passion from you. Of course, anyone listening can hear it, but I also know it from my sister, you know, both the, the kind of traps mm -hmm. of, of the career path, perhaps particularly mm -hmm. for dancing, but I think, you know, it's interesting that you had that class on the psychology of, of sport and the arts, because I think those, you know, we see it, at least in the, in the UK, you know, you see it with young men in, in uh, soccer, as you would call it, you know, or maybe you wouldn't, if, you, uh, depending on, I'm not sure, but like <laughs> football, soccer, see it with them, you know, they, they kind of achieve their dreams or they lose it when they're, you know, when they're 17, 18, 19, yes. 20. Um, and, and across sport and the arts in different ways, you know, there's lots, there's lots there that is kind of, yeah, I mean, there's lots there that could be looked at and, and worked with and, and much better support that could be there. I think we see some of that happening, but there are big parts of those industries where it really doesn't. But it's interesting, is this right? That what you said is it was really seeing what happened to yourself in that situation that made you think, I'm gonna learn about why this happens. And that yes. took you in some ways. Is that, was it as, as kind of, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't quite as straightforward as that, but it was that kind <laughs> yeah. of, that was part of the story. Yes, 
yeah, it wasn't a straightforward, it's messier process. I won't, I won't give myself that much credit to be like, oh yeah, I just connected the dots. But eventually that is what exactly led me to it is, is I have a deep, deep curiosity about how things work or why things happen. And I think, I think that's what's helped me become better and better as a coach is, is a deep desire to understand my own internal landscape. I feel like that is such an important piece as a coach. It's one thing to learn the skills, but it's also important to do your self-exploration, um, get coaching yourself, understand what's making you tick. What are you bringing to the relationship? And so I've had that curiosity. Um, I think that was triggered from that dance experience. It's like, oh, wow, I need to look inward. I, I, I was moving so fast that I wasn't investing in my relationship in general, but then especially my relationship with myself. And so have found that to be just a key component of how I operate in my day-to-day -day life, like self-awareness, self-growth, self-exploration, curiosity, um, looking at things from that lens has, has been uh, a real gift out of, out of that painful experience. Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes it does take those painful experiences, doesn't it, to kind of shift perspective or shift our perspectives. Did you have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious a little bit, it sounds like it partly came from that, but I don't think that's where everyone would go after, a, after an experience like that. What do you think it was that, that took you inside? Or maybe you'd already done some of that, you know, you already had part of that introspection muscle there. Yeah, I think it was... I had, I, I had to pause. There wasn't, you know, I, once you, once I stopped dancing my, my time, there was so much time all of a sudden and, um, I there, didn't have anywhere to run to. Uh, so I had to look inward almost. It was like a forcing function. Um, but then I found it to be, it was scary at first a little bit to be like, Ooh, what is driving me? Why am I doing this? But then ultimately it became really empowering to, to understand why I do what I do, what is driving me, why are my goals this way? And um, yeah, but I think, uh, you know, when working with new coaches, just bringing it back, like thinking about coaching, um, I find that they're nervous to look inward. And so I can relate to that experience a lot. I'm like, okay, let's tread lightly here. Um, but uh, eventually, I don't know if you see this in your work too, Robbie, it was just like, whoa, when they do finally get it, it's just those aha moments are just like, yes, they got it. And that, that's one of those things that I just love uh, when the person gets to that point where they see, oh, it's not as scary. And actually this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Uh, those moments that that's really powerful. And, you know, sometimes when I, sometimes it's lovely to have clients who are kind of already there or, or you know coaches yeah. and, and they're kind of diving in as soon as they meet you and that's wonderful but in some ways sometimes the the people that I've worked with that I remember the most are the ones who came as mm -hmm. super skeptics or just like really uncomfortable with it all and then by the end they're buying books about coaching or they're yeah. you know talking about it to their to their their children or or you know whatever it is I, I wanted to pull this thing out it's one of the notes I made when I was reading your book I, I mean it's both you know, I think it speaks to what we're saying. It's both um, shocking, but almost so shocking. It's, I mean, and this is not shocking. It's not meant to be a pun, but it's funny. You know, it's this, it's this piece, the study by uh, Wilson, uh, Timothy Wilson, who is a professor of psychology um, and colleagues at the University of Virginia, um, which asked people to do nothing but sit and think for, for 15 minutes. And they discovered mm -hmm. that two thirds of men and a quarter of women chose to subject themselves to an electric shock over simply a sitting alone with their thoughts. And one participant even went as far as shocking himself 190 times. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, an, you know, it's an incredible um, yeah. study and it does, it is kind of jaw dropping. What, what do you think's behind that? And why is it that, you know, maybe it took this real shock, you know, of another kind in your life to get you to that place, or maybe you, you had some of it already. And, and we often meet, meet people who are, find it difficult to look yeah. inside, but what do you think that's about? I think it's that people don't have the tools. Mm -hmm. I feel like they just, you know, we're not taught. I wish, you know, if I could redesign education, I'd be like, let's have introspection tools and emotional <laughs> intelligence and all these things. And I think, you know, um, if we had the tools to do the self-exploration where it doesn't feel as scary or a partner like a coach, it would be so different. And then society just 
isn't set up to allow us to pause ever. You know, we're constantly busy. Um, I talk about in my book, productivity itis. Like we are just constantly feeling like we need to be productive or move or go and stopping and pausing and having space to even sit with your thoughts is is almost like a uh, you know some like a luxury nowadays and it's it's a hard, it's it's heartbreaking for me because i feel like we cannot you know enter into a new world of work and solve some of the world's biggest problems if we aren't pausing and i feel like the world would be such a better place if we were all able to do this work um, to look inward and it takes work though and so that's where i get really really like i'm not going to I almost want to jump out of my chair excited <laughs> about coaching at scale, because if we have people that are helping others do this internal work at, at scale, there can be big shifts where people are pausing and really thinking about what is meaningful, what do we want, how do we want our children our, our, to live, what kind of world do we want our children to live in? Um, these deeper things and running from the next thing to the next obligation to the next obligation. And so no pressure to coaches, you know, but <laughs> it's up to I you. Think, yeah, yeah. But it's up to you to create this change at scale. But that's how I feel. I feel like coaching has the potential to do that. And I think if there's any time in our history, the time is now. And I, I think it's interesting that coaching industry has blossomed in parallel to how hyper-connected and quick moving our world of work and life is. It's very interesting that they're growing at the same rate. And um, I just think the time is now where coaches can really step up and make a difference. Yeah, I, I really agree. I think there's something about the particular kind of unusual set of conditions that we create in a coaching session that, that just lend themselves so much to the the complexity and and the, and you know the, the always on connected world that we're all living in. I, I guess I'm curious, you know, you so you kind of you found coaching as when you had the the psychology practice. How and when did like you know I I, I kind of got the feeling there was a kind of excited feeling when you first came across it and and realized it. But how and when did this kind of passion and conviction that you've got now develop over that over that coaching work as you did more and more of it? Yeah, I think it was just seeing the impact I had in my clients. So my coaching practice was a positive psychology coaching practice. And it was really- And, and just let's catch it for people. I mean, people can get it because it's got a good name. Positive psychology has got a good yeah. brand, but you know, people know what it is. But for you, what did that mean? Like uh, the, the idea of it being a positive psychology coaching practice? Yeah, for me, it really meant equipping people with the science-backed tools like selling men like PERMA, um, these really incredible models for flourishing in work and life. And so really focusing on building out those skill sets, those tools that again, I wish we had learned as children <laughs> and, and, and empowering people and leaders to do that. And just seeing how much that helped folks was, was um, incredible for me. And my coaching, I have clients that I worked with for, you know, um, years now and it's just and they're impacting other people they're leaders and it's just the most rewarding thing ever to to spread this knowledge and this this um skill set i feel like uh it just makes life so much easier um to, to help people uh equip them with with having a more resilience based uh toolkit for flourishing and work in life yeah, absolutely. And and as that maybe it, maybe it came from the psychology practice, but how did that practice develop for you? Where did, where did the people that you were working with come from? What was the how did you think about your work at that time? Yeah, it was it was a little bit challenging at first because I had a psychology practice, so I had to close that, and I actually sold the practice. Um, and so it was starting over and it was a little bit tough for me because I had to rebrand myself um, because I was a psychologist and it's like, what, wait, wait, are you a coach or a psychologist? And, and, and had you been practicing as a psychologist for quite a long time by that point? Um, yeah, for quite a few years. And then I had been in uh, like academic settings at the um, University of California, Los Angeles, and, and had done my pre and postdoc work at um, University of California, San Diego and stuff. So 
um, yeah. So it was a little bit challenging for me to figure out how I wanted to brand myself too. Um, and find step into kind of how I wanted to show up as a coach and, um, took a little bit of time. I think when I first started, it was a little, it was intimidating. Like I didn't just get clients right away. Um, it took some time and I had to just believe like, okay, this is going to work and this is going to fill up. And, and, and eventually, you know, just doing great work with the few clients I had, and then they told other folks and then it just naturally built, um, which, which I was fortunate to have really great clients who were excited to share the news. Um, and then also just meeting other coaches helped tremendously in kind of solidifying my own brand, how I wanted to show up as a coach, you know, like I work with leaders, like what's your leadership style? It's like, okay, what, what is my coaching style? Like, what do I stand for as a coach? What are my guiding principles as a coach? Um, how do I, how do I want to share that in, in the world. So it took some work, but you know, it, it's a creative process. And so just having faith that, that, um, you know, it's a startup that when you're starting your business. And so it takes a little bit of time. And, and that's what I communicate to coaches who are stepping into it. Like, don't worry. I know it seems scary right now. Um, you know, you, it feels like you don't have enough clients or something, but, but in time, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a time piece too, I think. Yeah. And, you know, you, you thank the clients, but probably the reason the clients were telling people about your work was because you were doing really good work with them and you were seeing all those results that you were just talking about. Had, did you, because it's interesting to think about, you know, for, for, you know, I'm not one, but I know others who are, for coaches who are also psychologists or have that, you know, have come from that angle, you know, did you do particular training to kind of really get yourself into the coaching mindset and space and set of practices and and what was tricky coming from that psychology background when you when you started coaching? Yeah, it's a great, great question because I know more and more psychologists are coming over to coaching, which is really exciting. Um, but it's a challenge. And so I, I did do a coaching program um, with the College of Executive Coaching, and it was designed for people such as myself, like clinicians who want to tr transition into coaching. So that was really nice just to have that clear, clear delineation and, and training um, tied to coaching versus just, okay, yeah, I can just jump into coaching because it's a different skill set. Um, and they're complementary if done well. And I think the hard part is for educating clients a lot, like, okay, this is coaching, this isn't therapy, and really trying to stay in my lane as a coach. Um, because therapy is its own really amazing specialty and is so powerful with the right people and the right time and the right dosage. It's, it's incredible. And so I think the two can be highly complementary. Um, you know, I have my own coach and I have my own therapist myself. So, <laughs> um, I like both, but I feel like both are very different. So educating, um, clients and, and making sure they're very clear on what expectations come, coming in and, and setting up that agreement first and foremost, the coaching uh, agreement is, is just was a big, big piece. Um, so yeah, that, yeah. So I definitely went through formal training. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's something, you know, when you were saying that, just telling that story then, you know, I was reminded that it's really good, you know, the contracting that we do with our clients is important yes. for them, but it's also important for us, isn't it? Yes. The clearer we've had it with the, you know, we've made it with the client that we, I'm here to do coaching today. Um, the clear, you know, that's useful for them and it's useful, it's absolutely useful for us. Um, you know, I want to, I want to definitely want to talk about the book and we definitely don't want to, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that I definitely want to talk about is better up because that's how we met, but yeah. where did that come into your journey? How long had you been practicing as a coach and, and, and um, you know, how did that develop just to join the dots for us so we can speak a bit about better up? Yeah, I had been doing my coaching practice for some time and um, you know, positive psychology was newer then. So this was, back quite a few years. I won't say how many years, <laughs> but it was, it was new. There was no one doing positive psychology practices. And, and, um, uh, and so, uh, I was spreading the news. I'm like, I love, you know, just trying to get it. I, I just peek out on this stuff. I'm just a nerd for this stuff in general. So anytime I can talk about positive psychology and coaching and evidence-based coaching, it'll happen. 
And so I was talking to a friend and they said, oh, you know what? I know two guys who are doing this startup and they're very interested in positive psychology. I think you should meet them. And so I um, met the founder, Alexi, at the mill in San Francisco. And we sat down, you know, this is before Better Up had an office or anything. And um, it was like this like two hour conversation that just flew by. It was like total in flow. I was like, oh my gosh, this person is like talking my language and just so engaged. And his idea was so powerful about democratizing access to coaching, like not, not, it shouldn't just be executives or uh, C-suite level that, that everyone could benefit from a coach. Everyone could benefit from this type of work. And I was just loved it so much. Um, and then met uh, Eddie, the other founder. And it was like, no question. Like, I, I mean, it just was something, I don't know how to explain it. It was just like this, you know, when you just kind of know this is something important and these people are the right people to do it. Yeah, and it, it's gone on to be successful and you've been a big influence on that. So so just for people who don't know, what was the, you moved into that work and did you, I guess I'm curious as well, I don't know actually, did you keep, were you continuing to coach alongside that or did that then become your work over a number of years? And and what was your role in that company? Which actually we're recording this at when, when are we end of March. So actually Better Up is probably um, as famous as it's ever been in the UK. Yes. Because they, and in fact, like I never thought, I genuinely didn't like probably for the first time ever, the BBC would have had a headline on its <laughs> newspaper page involving the word coaching, meaning what we meant. And that's because Prince Harry has just become, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the chief impact officer at Better Up. So. And they've just done a big fundraising round as well. And so, um, you know, clearly things have gone well there. But but for you, as you were getting involved there, how did that work? How did you decide to to become more involved? Yeah, it was a, it took some time. So I, I definitely was involved pretty, pretty intensely. But I also kept my coaching practice on the side um, for quite some time before jumping ship and going full time into Better Up. But I always had a few coaches always um, because I, I, I just that it's a skill set and you can't uh, you have to keep it sharp and so I'm still coaching even now um, just haven't stopped coaching throughout the whole process uh, but but yeah but it took me a little bit of time to be like okay I'm gonna say goodbye to my like formal practice and just have my few coaches come alongside with me um, in this journey but I think it's really benefited me to continue to have you know as 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 the head of coaching at Better Up, um, having empathy for the coaches and really, you know, and buy in too that I, I know what it's like, I know what you're facing. I didn't want to become detached from that. I feel like uh, if you're going to lead a community, you need to understand and walk in the shoes of the people and um, have deep empathy because it, it's tough to be a coach. It, it, it's, it brings its whole extra set of um, concerns and, and you know, it's entrepreneurial and, uh, you know, it's not guaranteed income every, like the same income every month or anything like that. So, um, trying to really come in from that deep empathy piece. And then also I feel like most coaches that I know are deeply invested in connecting with other coaches and learning. And so building out and wanting to build out, you know, better up has a pretty amazing coach community they're incredible coaches and it's just like the best place to go visit for me I'm like oh the community um and there's constant learning and I learned so much from all the coaches um I don't know if you saw it Robbie in the dedication of the book and the acknowledgement um section of the book yeah, I, I did. acknowledge all the coaches because I it's I've learned so much and I feel like part of learning is is learning from the wisdom of, of other coaches because we all have our own unique stories and and learnings from diving into this this field that is relatively new still yeah and uh, you know I guess to echo the, the what we were saying about Fred at the start you know it's you should know that that of course the work that you did is still rippling on um you know again I like I said I had a uh in fact, I had two, I, I worked for Better Up since almost, so we met, I think I was part of kind of a second group of European coaches that came on board. Mm -hmm. We met at an event of like, I don't know what it was, four years ago, four and a bit yeah. years ago, probably. And I've, I've worked, you know, it's been a small part of my work ever since. And and the reason it stays part of my work 
it, it, you know, it stayed when, when I let go of most of my associate work because I wanted to focus more on the real zone of genius stuff, Better Up stays because it's part mm -hmm. of that. And, and because there's something about the company which we could talk about a bit more if, if we want to. Um, but I was referring back to some notes today um, uh, from the videos of you um, talking, you know, doing demos of the first um, <laughs> first conversation with a potential, with a what you know, better up calls a member. And so that work is is really rippling on. And you could feel um, you you felt this, but I felt it in the audience when you did that. You did a presentation as part of the Better Up Coach community about this book um, about the burnout fix. You could feel the love in that room, right? So I hope yes. you, you remember that oh. as well. Yes. Yeah. It makes me smile. Yes. I always, yeah. Whenever I'm around the coaches, I'm just like, oh my gosh, again, these are my people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's lots of things we could say about Better Up, but I guess one of the things I'm curious about, and I think you can kind of feel it in the burnout fix as well is, um, you know, you've mentioned the science of, of all this stuff. You've, you know, one of the things I love about Better Up is the commitment of that company, um, which I'm sure you were a big part of too making it evidence-based, to making it as effective as we can, to looking at this new thing and thinking, well, why does it work? How, and how do we make sure if we, if we being better up, are gonna scale this thing, are we gonna try and democratize coaching and make it, make it accessible? How do we make sure that as we scale it, it doesn't lose quality? You know, which I think is yes. one of the really, really tricky things. So what did you learn over that time about the science of coaching? About, you know, and obviously that's probably a big question. So you know, whatever comes up, but about why it works, about the, the most important things you learn and how is that, you know, I guess part of that might be, how have you changed how you coach as you've learned about the science of how it works? Yeah, yeah, I love this question. Um, yeah, we are so committed to science. And I think that's important to me because A, I think people still, you know, coaching, it's it's newer, it's been around, but it, people, it's gaining traction. I'm, I, you know, to see it in headlines, like from the news that the recent announcements, it's very exciting for me. And so coaching is gaining traction, but I think there's people who still question the efficacy of coaching. And so the more that we can put science behind it and measure and show measurable outcomes, I think the more powerful of a case that we make to support the coaching industry, to show that there is real rigor. If it's done well, it can actually really make change. So that was a big piece in wanting to, to perpetuate the science of coaching to show how efficacious it can be in really driving change forward. And then also bringing in models um, from Martin Seligman, who is, you know, the godfather of positive psychology, bringing in models from incredible thought leaders like Barbara Fredrickson and, and really, and Fred Kaufman, like just really trying to bring in the best of best to up level the field too, and keep elevating our standards and ethical standards too. Um, as we coach better, we use technology to coach at scale globally. So uh, making sure that we're having the highest levels of ethics. And it's incredible because we have the largest data set of coaching now. I mean, it's years and thousands and thousands of sessions of coaching and um, being able to use that data set to inform like what makes a great coaching engagement um, and what makes for a great coach so that we can keep spreading that knowledge and up leveling ourselves and, and our coaches and I think coaches are always wanting to grow or the coaches that fit it better up, <laughs> I'd say, <laughs> really want to grow. Um, so it's, it's pretty amazing. And one of the biggest things is, is just reinforcing what the literature has found that, you know, that, that, that rapport, that alliance, the coaching alliance is so significant, especially at the beginning of coaching. Um, just getting, feeling like, okay, I trust this person can actually help me. So I'm going to actually invest myself and my psychological resources and energetic reserves to do this. And then later on in the coaching engagement, it is more about, is this coach challenging me just in the right amount of dosage or the right amount of push and stretch zone um, and knowing to meet the person where they're at. I think that that is, you know, takes years of pattern matching for practicing for coaching to know, okay, I can push just this much or I need to step back this much. And knowing where that zone is, is incredibly important later on. A, a therapeutic alliance, I mean, the, the coaching alliance is really, really important early on. So, I mean, there's so much, there's so much, um, you know, also cultural competency is a huge one that that um, looking into more and more with the literature. But um, yeah, there's so much to think about and, and look at to predict, you know, what makes it better best coaching relationship possible. And we're going to continue 
to gather these metrics and then hopefully disseminate them out too. So that, that coaching, the field of coaching keeps growing and and becoming stronger and stronger. So it gets me super excited and, um, yeah, if we can just keep legitimizing how impactful coaching can be, um, that, that, that would, that's a huge, um, a huge, uh, mission for me as well. Yeah. And and it's a really interesting one that you pulled out there that, that, uh, I can't remember actually what you said, but that, that, how far can I push my client right now? How do Mm -hmm. I get in that sweet spot? I think, you know, like you said, there's, there's an element of which for a coach that has to be just this part of it just has to be experience, right? That we have to do go through the, the practice of understanding and feeling the moment and the relationship and all that kind of thing. But is other things that, that coaches who are newer can do to, to get that sense or to, 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 to up level their skill in pushing their clients just the right amount, but not too much? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm a fan as a coach of being very forthcoming with my clients. So I'm like, hey, am I pushing too much or do we need to scale back? Like on a scale of zero to 10, where are we landing? Like, I want to find, I'm very like, I'm not trying to be secretive. I'm like, I'm trying to find the right special place where we can sit that feels challenging, but not pushing you in your stress zone. Like we want to keep you in your stretch zone. So are we doing that? And just really being open about my intentions, um, not making it like this, like, Ooh, behind the scenes, I'm thinking all this, but I'm not telling you. And I'm this, you know, I, I really think the transparency goes a long way in creating that rapport. And it is a working relationship. I can guide you, but you are the expert on yourself and you need to come to the table and, and tell me what's working and not working. And so setting that up too, in that initial kind of sessions where you're setting up the coaching agreements, right. Um, setting that up as well helps a lot later on when I'm just checking in with them. So it doesn't have to be this magical. And then later on, it can happen more intuitively. You don't even, I, I notice I don't even realize it sometimes until after I'm like, oh, I pushed them just right there. But in the beginning, I feel like it's more than okay to ask. And still, even today, I, I will double ask after the end of sessions. I'm like, how was today? I ask almost every session, give me feedback, please. Yeah. 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 And how has your coaching then changed um, over really immersing yourself through your time at Better Up in the science, in, in why this works and being part of those conversations with the absolute best of the best about how to make it work. And how has your coaching changed? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I think my coaching has become, I, it's not, it's, I guess the word humility comes up where the more I realize, the more I learn, the more I realize what I don't know. <laughs> So the more and more I learn, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much I don't know. And so really making sure that I come in with that humility and being just incredibly present um, and, and not just making assumptions when I move forward. So trusting that deep pattern matching that I've, I've seen thousands and th- I've worked thousands and thousands. If you count my clinical I don't even want to <laughs> think about how many hours I have my life have spent working with people. But so I have that intuitive pattern matching, but I feel like, you know, you can fall into the expert trap really easy. It's the experts that kind of can make the most mistakes. And I, I, I'm not saying I'm like the full, a full expert, but I, I, as I get deeper and deeper into sitting with this day in and day out, I do realize that that can be a hazard in some ways because Sometimes when we're learning, we're actually more careful and more deliberate and thoughtful. So really trying to stay humble and and reflect a lot and work with and talk with other coaches more and more to stay on that edge of realizing, um, you know, am I I sticking to all these fundamentals? Because I think it can become second nature where we're just kind of like cruise control if we're not careful. And so really wanting to be deliberate constantly. And it's really interesting, like if you think about uh, mountain climbing or uh, free diving and things like oftentimes the people who have the major injuries are the people who are like really experts. And it's like, you almost get the confidence to the point where it actually isn't, isn't helping you anymore. So trying to hold on the humility. And then I think the other thing that's really um, been important to me is the process of coaching. So not just, and I tried to emphasize this in the coaching stories in my book, but it's not just what we're talking about. I am looking so intensely at 
are they looking down? Are they fiddling with something? Are they breathing? Are we pausing to make space? How fast are we going? You know, the cadence, the whole process, not just the content about what we're talking about, but the actual process that we're in together, what is happening in that? And that's been fundamental in picking up on things that just the person may not be able to articulate um, as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that does come across in the stories in the book. As I was reading um, The Burnout Fix, I, you know, it's interesting, I recognized some things that felt like they were reflections of better or vice versa, or the same <laughs> ideas had come in. And one of the things I thought that was was interesting about the book was it felt like in some ways you were trying to do something quite ambitious. And I think you succeeded doing this, which is write a book that would work for someone who had never done coaching before, mm -hmm. right? And have enough depth and breadth in there that for someone who has read, you know, uh, who has been a coach for 10 years and has read a lot of books in that time, because they're like one of your people, they love learning, yeah. <laughs> that there'll still be a uh, depth and texture um, mm -hmm. in the book. And I think you do succeed at that. And I could talk a little bit about why, but I guess I'm curious, um, how did you, like, we know a little bit about why you wrote this book, uh, but we could talk a bit more about that. And I, I, yeah. I quite like to, you know, and there's some amazing statistics that you have about burnout in the book that, that are kind of mind boggling. But mm -hmm. I, the first question I want to ask, which is, maybe this is just me at my weird mind, is how did you think about writing it? So how did you decide to structure it? And how did you bring in the kinds of practices and assignments that are in there? And with all the kind of knowledge of how to develop people that you have, yeah. How you thought about writing this book is almost as interesting to me as what's in the book, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, it was a process, Robbie. Like, <laughs> I just like better up. I, you know, we are optimistically ambitious. Like, and I think that's what happened in the book in some ways. I'm like, I can make it because I, I just felt frustrated that there's so many books that are incredible, but they're all on one subject. And to be able to synthesize all of this and make it into kind of one model for, um, that encapsulates all that without being too high level is really, really challenging. Um, but I also know that not everyone has the time to read all these things and amass cross-functional knowledge. And so I, I think as I wrote it and structured it out, I was a little bit naive about what I was getting into, to be honest. And then as I, <laughs> as I started to work on it, I was like, oh, this is, this is challenging because I want coaching stories in there, but I want it to be practical. So I'm going to have practical things in there. But then I also want the personal piece because I don't want to be like an expert talking at people. I want to tell people like, Hey, I struggle with this too. This is something I have worked on myself. So I, I, I actually changed it from a lens of, okay, I need to disseminate all this information to, okay, how have I gathered this information personally and use this? So I was definitely throughout many years of my life been the guinea pig for this, 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 my, my model, which is Pulse, and then my clients as well. And thinking about, okay, this is how I teach it to them. Cause I literally like, will go through these elements in my practice and then how have I learned this and then structuring it um, as such. So it, it was a lot. I mean, it took a lot of post-it notes and thinking about it, but I wanted to give enough so that it, you know, in the end, it has that periodic table of elements for a resilient life to make sure people can mix and match different tools. And I call them compound and make different compounds so that it's not a one size fits all approach, just like coaching. We're not going to give the same, you know, no one has the same goals. No one has the same, um, tool set that's going to help them. So how do I make it as personalized as possible? That was really important to me. I didn't want a one size fits all approach, especially to something as complicated and serious as burnout. So it was, I'm, thank you for asking this question because it was hard. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it was not easy. And, um, you know, wanting it to be challenging enough for folks who really know this stuff pretty well, and it's probably not new to them. So how can I at least incorporate the coaching stories and give it the depth and, and color that, that captures what coaching sounds like, not just a coaching case, but dialogue, um, showing like we need to have spaciousness and silence in our sessions with 
people who are running constantly, constant motion? How do we create spaciousness in sessions? So all of those things I was trying to incorporate. So, um, wow, it was a big, ambitious, <laughs> similar to better up yeah. undertaking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Is and well, and it's it's tricky because, um, you know some people who read this will be curious or they'll be feeling the beginnings of burnout but with a title like the burnout fix you were mm -hmm. going to be speaking some of the time to people who are right in the middle of this thing mm -hmm. and that's really tricky because you're providing you know and it's a tr like you're providing five i mean it's five real pulse with five real kind of center or pillars you might say mm -hmm. five is quite a lot and i yeah. think that what's what i noticed as i was reading it um, is I was reading the, f I think I was reading P and I was like, oh, this is, yeah, you know. And then I, I got, I think to L and we can talk about what these are in a second. I was like, oh, right. This is, <laughs> this is where I'm at right now. It's right in the middle of, of needing this one. I think, you know, there's something nice about that, that problem. Well, that thing that happens for us as we learn and grow, which is we come back to some of the same things again and again and again. And I suspect that those five those five things are things that people will come back to again and again and again. Um, I mean, I mean, like, I mean, I'm going to pull them up because I just think there's so many of them in the book. But it's worth talking about the concept of burnout. I think yeah. we, we we need to do that really before we jump into any more detail. Yeah. Just want to. I'll give you a few of these, and you know, because they're straight out of your book, so I, I can. You won't have to remember them, right? A recent Deloitte workplace burnout study found that 77% of respondents have experienced burnout in their current job. Gallup study of nearly seven and a half thousand people found that 23% reported uh, feeling burned out at work often or very or very often or always. Um, excessive workplace stress has been estimated to account for a staggering 120,000 deaths each year. I imagine that's just in the United States. So even more when we think about worldwide, costing billions of hundreds of billions of dollars to the economy, um, you know, and more. Yes. And then all those stats are pre-COVID. Right. So right. the impact of COVID is on top. That was already before COVID-19 happened. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think maybe the, you know, there's, there's kind of so many places we could go here just into, and, and I'll, you know, you take us where you think is most important, but one of the things that, that came up and you've touched on it already, and maybe because of the likely audience of this podcast, it, that's a good place to go. Um, it's actually, a, you know, it's a question from a member of the Coaches Journey community as well was, you know, are coaches particularly from Alex, are coaches particularly at, at risk for something like this? And when I was researching a bit before the podcast, it looks like the term burnout was coined about carers, mm -hmm. originally about doctors, about physicians, right? And it's like yep. the, the values to help and the stresses of work kind of causing this really vicious cycle. But how, maybe how do you think about burnout now? And then what do you think about burnout for coaches? And, and are there particular things that we, we as coaches need to be aware of when it comes to burnout? Abs, thank you for bringing this up because it's so relevant. Um, and I, you know, a better up, I am always thinking about the coaches. I've been leading a burnout support group even for the coaches because, oh man, it, it's a real thing. And in, you're right, burnout has, you know, was originally found in 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 professions, helping professions. So teaching, where you're giving to others, nursing, healthcare, um, social work, anything where you're really invested in, in helping other people, but you have constraints where, you know, there may not be as much control or over workload or all of these things. And, you know, burnout happens for a variety of reasons. It's not, this is the biggest thing I wanted to emphasize in my book, even though I'm giving tools to help the individual, it's not an individual problem only. Um, it is, it's, it's, it's not just due to poor coping strategies. We exist in an environment and you cannot look at an individual without looking at the environment they exist in. And you cannot look at an environment or a social environment without looking at the people that make up that environment. So it's important to really understand that, you know, we're existing, yes, as individuals, um, we have individual mindsets and behaviors, or we may be type A or something else that makes us more prone to burnout. But there's also teams we exist in, organizations we exist in. And then that's all housed in this larger societal issue, which I try to really challenge through these myths in my book about what success means. That success is like, you know, these misnomers about 
you know, like in or you know, to working more produces more work uh, work output. And I'm like, nope, not really. <laughs> Beyond a certain threshold, your productivity diminishes. Um, or success is intimately intertwined with chronic stress. Like if you're going to be successful, you're just going to have to be chronically stressed. And that's not true either. Um, it has diminishing returns. So uh, I think I think understanding that piece about burnout is really, really important. And, and I think of burnout as happening from, you know, when the, this is what the research has found, a mismatch between, you know, our capacities as human beings and the nature of our work. We are human beings. We are not machines. And if we try to change who we are, push ourselves to operate, to match our hyper-connected, not very human kind of way of operating now with endless emails and like, I mean, it's just information overload. We are going to malfunction. And so uh, for coaches, I think, especially during COVID, like we are sitting in Zoom uh, staring at screens. We are providing deep levels of emotional energy and investment. And sometimes, you know, we, we can only help so much our clients too. And that can create deep, deep levels of compassion fatigue. And so I think it's incredibly important for coaches to be pro proactively monitoring for burnout in themselves um, and thinking about ways to replenish and micro ways. It doesn't have to be big overhauls, but just checking so that we don't have this chronic nervous system activation where we're just running ourselves um, into the ground because then our, our, our skills as coaches become compromised um, and our ability to have empathy. If we overwork, literally your ability to have empathy goes down, which is like, whoa, huge factor for coaching. Um, and so, and then also, I think meeting with other coaches is the hugest one. Normalizing that or feeling this way can be so huge. Like coaches that I deeply respect are like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. And it's it's really okay. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be tired in this profession. That doesn't mean you're a bad coach or you're not doing well. It just means you're a human being and you're tired. And I think I think that's huge. Yeah. And and the, you know. <sighs> There's something, isn't there, about the, uh, there's a story that I hear a lot from coaches, you know, that, that they have to present this um, external picture of perfect. I mean, this is true across society, right? We could talk about the impact yes. of Instagram on young people and all those kind of things. But mm -hmm. for coaches particularly, there's a sense, oh, no one will ever hire me if I don't look like I'm perfect, if I don't have it yes. all together. And mm -hmm. that, I think, is quite pernicious when it comes to this thing that we're talking about right now, which is, you know, actually, like, and, you know, I don't mind saying I found the last year particularly. I mean, I've had I've had levels where I've got really close to the edge before, um, but the last year has been hard, um, it's been and hard. and there are you know many reasons for that. Um, but I th I think you're absolutely right that that well, and you know, it's another reason that you've got your coach, I've got my coach, we've yeah. got our support yeah. networks, right? It's because. Oh, yeah. It's like if I don't have that stuff, then I'm 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 you know I could easily get lost in in the struggles of being a solo entrepreneur, let alone one who cares so much, let alone one who you know is in the middle of a global pandemic. Yeah, just that, oh, just dear. that. You know, um, absolutely having the coach and the support network is fundamental and something I try. Hopefully, it came across in the book. I'm like, hey, I'm a psychologist. I study burnout, and I can still burn out. Like you know, it, it's, 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 uh, doesn't discriminate. It does not discriminate. And it just means you're human and you're just getting pushed pretty hard and that's yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. I guess maybe this feels like, and I, I don't, I don't know if there's a particular example from the book that you want to, you want to bring in here, but for the, for anyone who's listening, who's sudden, who's in this moment sitting there thinking, uh, maybe they're just admitting it to themselves now. Maybe they've known it for months, right? But they're right in the middle of this thing. They can feel the the vitality sli has slipped out of their life in different ways. They can feel that sense of of the overwhelm of of the ever connectedness. Where do you, and and maybe this is also an answer to a to another question actually from from the community from Alex about when we get a client who's in the middle of that place you know, mm -hmm. or we spot that, or what can we do that best supports clients who we, we suspect are on the edge? 
where's the place to start? Because it's such a, you know, the, your book is, is as complex as it needs to be um, mm -hmm. to deal with something so complex. So in, that, in those moments where you're speaking to someone who's in the middle of it, or you've, you've got a client who you suspect might be, where do you, where do you invite people to start? Yeah, it, you know, it, I'm really looking at the first thing I'm just trying to do is normalize and um, just try to hold space, you know, allowing them to, and, and reassuring them, like th thanking them actually for stepping in and, and addressing this. Um, that takes a lot of bravery. I think burnout is still very destigmatized. I mean, stigmatized, I think any weakness or not being okay is, is stigmatized still. And it's like, yeah, you, make this, you make this great point in the book about how leisure is sometimes seen as laziness, which I was yeah. just like, Oh, wow, that's true. And I, I never really thought about it like that. All these stories about how even yeah. resting is somehow, you know, yeah. not only not even neutral, but, but bad. Yes. Yeah. And then if, if you're, if you're struggling or you need help with burnout, like that's bad. And it's like, yeah. no, they, you know, it's good. You're recognizing it. The sooner you can recognize burnout, the sooner you can do something to course correct. The last thing you want to do with burnout is let it get to the point where you are just deep in it. That takes so much more work to get out of it. And so uh, that's the first thing I do. And then the next thing I do is, you know, in the book, I talk about it just in the very intro, but there's like six mismatches between the nature of a person and their work that um, can lead to burnout and uh, it's fairness you know, so if there's an absence of fairness in their work, a breakdown in community, so if they're feeling lonely, um, workload, if they're working too much, there's a mismatch in values. So if your boss or your work is not aligning with your core set of values, that's going to take a toll. Um, you're not feeling rewarded, so you're not getting the payment. You're putting in so much effort to build your practice and you're not getting the financial reward or intrinsic reward and then control. So COVID took away a lot of our control. And so figuring out which of those six mismatches um, the person's at helps a lot in going, okay, let's start there. It's mm -hmm. a lack of control. Okay. Does that resonate with you? Let's talk about that. How do we fill in more control in your life? So it gives a great starting place to get really granular about what is causing the burnout. And then that can inform which of the pulse practices um, I give or suggest to them um, to, to lean into. So if it's a breakdown in community, I'm going to be like, like, let's secure support. Let's start with one of the things in there. Let's talk about, you know, is it um, breath, you know, building out a network um, or is it boundaries? Uh, so we can get more granular. So starting with the six mismatch, starting with normalizing, getting into the six mismatches and then kind of figuring out what maps the best um, in terms of matching with their goals that they set in the coaching session. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's what a great answer. So much, so much in there. Uh, like I've got a funny question. I think it's, I think it's funny anyway, but it's also yeah. a serious one. Like yeah. you have very good alliteration game, Jacinta, like, oh. the, like it's everywhere in the book and I love it. Like it's even, I can, I can't quite read it behind you. You've got a copy of the book. It's even in the subtitle of the book. I don't know if that was you or if that was someone at the publishers, but it, yeah. I, it, so I thought that was a, it's funny. It's great. Cause there's, there's, um, you know, it's like, uh, the, the three P's here and the, the yes. three C's and the three S's and the three B's and the three E's. And yes. I was just wondering, is that like you using a natural strength? Um, or is, but I also suddenly when I was thinking about it, cause it's you, I was like, oh, is this, is this like the research? And this is what I need to be doing more. Like, what, what, or is it just that you think it's fun and memorable? Uh, a little bit of all of it. So, yeah. so um, the title, the, the publishers came out with the subtitle. So I was like pleasantly surprised it had alliteration in there. But um, the other parts, I really believe that people, you know, the research shows that people l learn from threes, you know, threes making it easy. I figure people who are, are trying to learn this are going to have be cognitively taxed or already have information overload. So how do I make it easy as possible for them to remember? Okay, it's three Bs. Okay, what are the three? So it just it's a more of a mnemonic kind of device for them to to understand that okay these things line up here, these things line up here. So um, that it didn't feel as overwhelming. Um, the more I could package it, because it's so much, it's, it's a very complex model and there's so much in there. And so making it easy for people to flip back to sections they want, because it's really an operating manual. I don't want people to read it and be like, I'm supposed to do all this? Like that would, 
<laughs> that would freak me out. So I have at the end, like, you don't have to do all this at once. Yeah. Um, this I have is... to say, when I read that bit, I was like, oh, phew, you know, because there is so <laughs> yeah. much in there. And it, and it, yeah. and it is, it is. Well, I love you, you told the story about a client, I think, who made kind of, um, I'm not sure whether it was about the, I can't remember if it was about the kind of concept as a whole or one bit of it. It's like made himself some like uh, revision cards so that he yes. could remember those things. And and probably yes. actually there's a there's a merchandising idea there for you to see, so which you could take, <laughs> right? The card, the the, the flashcards and the mm -hmm. and, and that periodic table to put behind your computer um, yes. are, are great things. I, I, I wonder if like, because we've talked about it actually, let's, let's, I wonder if we could name it those, that, that pulse, yeah. you know, that acronym and those five practices, because I think they are, they'll give people a sense of both the different ways that we might tackle it mm -hmm. when someone is facing burnout or when we're facing it, but also, um, and also the places to think about going when faced with a client who's, who's right, or a friend indeed, who's right in the middle of these kind of things. Yeah, yeah. So pulse I picked that word. It took me a long time to find that word, but Christina Maslach is one of the foremost researchers in burnout. Um, she's one of the pioneers, like in the trenches, really seeing it day to day from early on. She describes burnout as an erosion of dignity, spirit, and will, an erosion of the human soul. And for anyone who has, I mean, that's powerful. And for anyone who has burned out like myself, it really does feel that way. You're just like, I lost this piece of me. Like you feel so disconnected from something you were barely invested in. And so I, I was like, well, the same way we talk about taking care of our physical health, we have to take care of our spirit, our essence, our vitality. It's something bigger than just well-being to me. It's 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 your yeah, it's your pulse, it's your your personal pulse. So that's that's where that word came from. And it's woven throughout um, but your heart. And I feel like if we lead with heart center leadership, heart center coaching, all of that, um, we will make a bigger impact on the world as well. So the P stands for, uh, and then let me, oh, before I get into each letter, it's an integrative approach because burnout is so complex and multifaceted, right? Um, I just talked about six mismatches. There's three components that make up burnout. So you can't just have a blanket, just rest and you know, meditate and yoga your way out of burnout. No, it's much more complex. So it's a, you know, cognitive, behavioral, social, physical, emotional, integrative approach to burnout. So the P is behavioral and it's pace for performance. And it's all about getting into that stretch, stretch zone where you're very highly productive, but you're not going over the edge to the point where you are hanging out in that chronic nervous system activation stress. And also you're learning, you're stretching yourself how to learn optimally. And like, this is what I wish again, we had learned as children, like this is how schools should be structured with that curiosity. Um, the U is undo untidy thinking. So not clean, clearing your mind, but just being hyper aware of your thoughts and having the space to really think about, do I think this thought is true? What's another way of thinking about this and, and keeping our mental hygiene tight. Um, because when we are hit with uncertainty, our mind can just go and tell lots of different stories. The L is leverage leisure. So it's not talking about exercise and sleep and nutrition, which are really important, but I wanted to get into not so obvious things. So like solitude, um, silence and sanctuary and nature, these things that we have evolved to find restoration and, you know, from an evolutionary time frame, we have spent 99.9% .9 of our our species has spent 99.9% .9 of its time in nature. We are wired to find restoration in nature. So how do we do that optimally based on the science? It's just such cool science around that. And then the S is all about securing support. We are human beings. We are wired to connect. We come into this world literally connected to another <laughs> human being. And so we have to figure out ways to forge really solid connections um, that allow us to have breath and thinking and operating um, while also protecting ourselves through boundaries. And then the E is evaluate effort. That's the emotional piece. So um, that is about managing your energy, your emotions, and also living through guiding principles about meaning and purpose. So it is a lot. It is a lot. And for each of those five, there's three sub practices, but it, it, the idea is to give you as many tools as possible. And then you can mix and match the tools or work with your client to go, let's dive into these three tools. And you can make 
lots of recipes. It's a choose your own adventure process, which I think is cool because it matches what coaching is like. That's it's, it's very coaching esque, <laughs> I'd say. It, it definitely is. It, you know, it definitely is, but in a, in a great way. Um, one of the things I noticed in the way that you invite people to, again, this is more of a kind of technical question in some ways, but the, the way that you invite people to to work on these things quite often is with a is with a scale. It's like where mm -hmm. am I now and where do I want to get to? And and I love that there's a great there's a, I love the piece about um, I think it's in the I think it's in um, secure support. You're talking about which are the ones that will broaden my network that are the easiest to do and, and how do I rank them and that kind of thing. Again, is, is that a is that using that zero to ten scale? Is that something that is just a part of your practice? Is it something that you've that, that the research says is, is really useful for people or what, what makes that such a thread? I think it's a really useful one. I think lots of people doing it will find it really valuable. Yeah, yeah, it's a core part of my practice and it's also really based on the science of behavior change that we have to start with small things. So I always give my clients like, you know, if we're setting up homework between sessions, I'm like, how challenging is that for you? Let's rate it. And we we look at what they're 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 setting up for themselves for their goals between sessions and um, starting with the smallest, you know, easily achievable goals so that they build up that sense of self-efficacy and they get confident. And then we ratchet it up and then we go to, okay, this is a three out of 10 difficulty to change. Okay. I got that. Okay. Let's do five out of 10 and then let's do seven out of 10. Let's try the 10 out of 10. And by then they have the confidence and skills versus just throwing them in and being like, okay, I want you to talk to your boss about this really tough thing and let's figure this out. It's like, if they don't succeed, that's gonna create a lot of um, lowered self-efficacy. And one of the foundations of burnout is inefficacy. That's one of the core components of burnout. And so how do, that's a fundamental way where you can build out efficacy with your clients and stretch them just little by little by little. Um, and they come back so excited because they were successful and they're making progress and humans love to make progress. So setting them up for success. Yeah, and I think in you know that 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 piece about you know you talk about if you set too big goals you end up back on more alliteration coming up the the wheel of weariness right and it's yes. like um, it you know I think that's a really interesting thing and I, I it made me think about my coaching practice and realize that there have definitely been times where we've set goals I've set goals with clients that were too big and they they mm -hmm. weren't conducive and it made me really remember that. Um, that 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 idea of, of bringing the goal making the goals manageable of, of thinking in that way it also got me thinking that that you know that the way that you talk in the book and you've just kind of hinted at and talked about a bit about self-efficacy and how the, a particular kind of practice and goal setting really builds that it, it struck me that that coaching when done right you know that's one of the things it just undeniably builds for people or it should do mm -hmm. you know that that cycle of self-efficacy growing and and that's a, mm -hmm. like a abuse for me that's a really beautiful thing to think about and especially if we're thinking about the kind of the big picture of coaching and, and the impact that we as an yeah. industry can have if we can increase the self-efficacy and and for me that that as a, as a as a human I think this is probably part of burnout as well when my self-efficacy is higher my hope is higher absolutely uh, and certainly my hopelessness is much lower and mm -hmm. and I just wanted if do you think that that's true that that when coaching is done well one of the things that we're doing is is really building self-efficacy in people yeah absolutely I think that's one of the biggest outputs of coaching when done really well is you know self-efficacy is that that belief that you can do something and, and see it through and accomplish it and and building out that confidence but it's a deeper it's a deeper sense of Oh yes, I can I can take this on and see this through, um, and that brings up optimism, hope. Uh, it, it lends itself to a growth mindset because you're constantly feeling like you can stretch yourself and and go into you know a little bit of unknown. Um, but it really takes careful consideration of what your clients are setting goals for themselves. Like recently, I had a client wanting to do a morning practice to center themselves, and you know he was like, I want to start with 45 minutes. And I was like, oh, that's a big one. How about we scale that back, you know? And we ended up at five minutes. And, and then if those five minutes go well, we can add in five more minutes. Um, so it doesn't have to be this big overall and, and behavior change. And I think my, my client, I notice my clients get really excited and in the moment we're jiving. And so they set these big goals and 
they probably could make them work, but in the end, behavior changes, little tiny things over time that add up. Um, that's why New Year's resolutions don't really work out <laughs> because they're just too big. And along the way, what I'm trying to do is actually not just change their behavior, but change their identity. So let's say they're working on a goal. This is just a general goal because I usually work with at work, but this is just more of a universal goal, like someone who's trying to get better eating habits. Or not just like, okay, well, let's change your eating habits little by little. We're also at parallel working on how is your identity changing? I am a healthy person. So that's huge so that they have that identity shift alongside the self-efficacy. Instead of just saying, I want to eat healthy. It's like, I am stepping into this um, place where I see myself as a healthy person. And as a healthy person, I eat this way. So mm-hmm. um I think that that self-efficacy goes such a long way in helping them shift, you know, their, their kind of identity tied to that goal, the why, the bigger why that we set up with our coaches, coaches. Yeah. One of my, um, one of the th- I really liked in the book when you, you talk about per- thinking of thinking about why you talk about personal mission statements. There's a really mm-hmm. nice formula. This is another bit, a bit like realizing I need more time in leisure, uh, in nature because of the, 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 you know, the L yeah. when I was reading that part about personal mission statements, I was like, okay, here's the other part that I need to do some work on right now. You know, I'm sure there'll be times mm-hmm. when it's, it's the others too. You know, I wonder if you could just share a little bit about where that model, that way that you guide us through in the book, the personal, mis- personal mission statement, if I can say that <laughs> comes from, and you know, what your personal mission statement is, is right now. Yeah. I think this one is so important because you know, in the end, the personal mission statement, I have my clients end up with three guiding principles, enduring principles, basically, so they, that they can just judge anything off of. And literally, I've had clients, I love this, make coffee mugs. So every morning they see their three things like. Um, I read that in the that book. They, I thought, what a great idea. <laughs> yeah, I have them on my mirror. So every every day I get up when I brush my teeth, I see these three things that, that really guide me. So um and, and the process came out with, it's really hard to just say, find meaning, just yeah. find meaning. And, you know, there's so much work around research around job crafting where you can actually make meaning. And so it's about setting up to look at your values, which we do as coaches, right? We're doing deep value work. And then from there, pulling out, okay, so tied to what I, my vocation, how do my values map onto my vocation? And then how does that map onto my unique skills? And then how does that result in kind of this meaningful pursuit? And then what are three enduring principles? Like be a, you know, be constantly curious, um, do less. Like what are these three things that you just have that you know, just like a company has a mission statement and they have their core values and these kind of leadership behaviors we should have for ourselves. And so it's basically crafting that for yourself, thinking of yourself as your own mini company in a lot of ways. And you have your guiding values and your leadership principles. And that's what you, um, uh, you know, assess everything against. And I do this. And so my, my meaningful pursuit is to help others through science live their lives with vitality um, and meaning and authenticity. That's that's my big, big mission. Um, and I, I really try to follow that. And so with this book, even I'm getting inbound like requests and things and I, everything I'm like, does this align? Does this align? Does this align? Because the more we can stay in alignment, the less we're going to have that mismatch and values that leads to burnout. Um, and that's a huge one for me. If I am not in line with my values, and I think this is for coaches in general, that's why we pick this. Sometimes we've left our jobs be, and to become coaches to, to live aligned with our values of helping people. Um, if we get out of alignment with our values or, or we say yes to something that doesn't feel completely right to us, it, it will take a toll. And so I, I love this work and my clients really like it a lot. Um, and it's so concrete for them because meaning a lot of people get really overwhelmed. I don't know what meaning is. People want meaning so bad. They don't know how to find it. So trying to give them something much more concrete, um, I think is really important. And it's really fun to do with clients. If you haven't tried it, it's really, really fun. Yeah. And I, I, you know, if, if anyone, anyone's listening who, who, um, is going to pick up the book. I really recommend just, you know, it, you could do it from what Jacinta just said, but but in the book, it, it lays it out really clearly. And 
yeah, I'm looking forward to doing that with clients. And I started doing it, I, I sent you a message, I think, when I was uh, sitting on my balcony at some point, like having little sparks go off, but I you know, had to stop reading at that point, which wasn't great because I was running a bit behind on finishing ahead of the interview. <laughs> um, this is a bit <laughs> later actually after I messaged you, um, but to stop because to, it was sparking so many ideas for me about, about what, uh, yeah, what, what, what makes meaning for me and, and what, what it might be in the future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just to just just to finish we're you know we're almost at time uh, it feels like i you know we haven't there's so many parts i wanted to ask you to tell the story about mr sims you know and also there's so many parts of your journey that that are, that are great but people can get the book and they can read that and, and, and that's great <laughs> um thanks also i'm really glad that this conversation aligned with those guiding principles for you Absolutely, um, it because it's been a total pleasure I guess before we finish, I mean, maybe it's as simple as this, you know, is there anything other than picking up the book or, or, or just, you know, thinking about these issues more and, and helping people live with more vitality, you know, both themselves and the, and the um, clients they work with. Is there anything else that you want to say that we haven't, that we haven't covered in this interview that feels important to share at this point? I think, First of all, I'm so happy to be here. This is very values aligned. <laughs> yes, high five. Um, <laughs> high five. Whenever I can interface with a coach, I, I, I feel like it's just, because um, I wrote this book for coaches in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, it's all based on my coaching practices and all the exercises are based on practicing with coaching. So it's just delightful to be here. Um, and I think the big thing I would say to end on is just that, that hard work and smart work are not at odds um, with leisure, rest, recovery, replenishment, taking care of your personal pulse. The two go hand in hand. When we are more centered, when we are more resilient, when we um, are more vibrant, we show up to everything, our communities, our families, our children, our customers, our partners um, in such a more productive ways and everyone ultimately benefits. And so I think it's really important to start. If I could do anything, it's like urge people to make this shift, like hyper work isn't, it doesn't have all the returns you think it does that, that investing in these things. And this is when, you know, we have to address societal and organizational pieces too, because I, I know it's hard to do that in the context of where we operate. So I understand that piece. Um, I feel like it would just, we'd have so much more innovation, tolerance, and just um, goodwill all around. I really do believe that. Yeah, absolutely. Jacinta, thanks so much for that, for all the work you do, um, and for the time today. Um, yeah, on behalf of everyone who's listening, thank you. Thank you. I'm very grateful to be here. <laughs>